can you give us a little introduction about yourself? I'm Owen McGonagall. I went to Pace uh, from 2017 to 2021. In those glorious years, I studied English language and literature and adolescent education in English. Um, I'm now back actually at Pace as a grad student getting my master's in literacy. And I'm currently an English teacher in Brooklyn. How was your time at Pace and um, especially like in the Honors College? But I feel like my time at Pace was defined by the Honors College. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm being completely honest, whenever I think about my fond memories or people ask me about Pace, my first instinct is to respond in regards to the Honors College. I feel as though that's where the community was. That's where everyone that I'm still in contact with um, was from. And that's where I felt as though I, I had the most support, the most guidance, the most direction, and just the most just friends and connections there. What would you say is your favorite honors memory? I mean, anything to do with Jacqueline, if I'm being honest. Um, <laughs> Jackie and I, we we go. But I probably maybe, if I could just list a few brief ones, just, you know, taking the trip to Greece with the Honors College, um, living with all my, you know, honors friends. I met my best friend at the Honors College, um, and we're still, you know, like this to this day. Um, and just having those, like, tight-knit fond memories that you can make mm -hmm. in an otherwise like enormous city I think is like so that's what I look back on when I think about honors. Do you have any favorite honors events or traditions that come to mind? Well I mean if you just flip through like Jackie's photo album we literally took a picture every Harry Potter movies night. Um, I loved all those. Um, I loved you know dressing up for those. Um, we also had a bunch of like remember floor events and I'm not gonna lie I didn't go to all of them but it was just uh cute but I would say definitely the Harry Potter movie night was like my favorite I also love when Jackie would just like randomly have like tickets to shows and she'd be like honors who wants them um but yeah to circle back definitely Harry Potter movie nights and as someone who's currently watching Harry Potter I think back on those awesome what advice would you give current honors students now I would tell current honor students to both take every opportunity that you can, um, but also find your balance. I think there are so many opportunities kind of given to you right away that I think not everyone is given. And I would totally take ownership of them, take agency over them and like kind of like find the ones that you think will benefit you and suit you. Um, and then once you do that, kind of find your groove, find, you know, what kind of, things you want to do, what opportunities you want to take, what opportunities you want to say no to, um, and ultimately kind of like cultivate that like balance in your life of, you know, forward progression while also maintaining your self-care and maintaining just, you know, your sanity in New York. Was there anything like any clubs or organizations that you were part of? I wrote for the Honors Herald uh, every now and then. Along those same lines, I was a member of the Pace Press. So I did write for the Pace Press um, for two years. I was the uh, opinion editor, the social media manager, and I wrote the uh, the romance column back when we had one. I don't know if y'all still do, but um, I did that in my time. And would you like recommend, um, would you recommend those two or any other organizations? Um, I would definitely. Um, my time at the Pace Press was probably some of my second fondest, like, you know, right beneath honors. My time at the Pace Press was very much a fun time. It actually led to, you know, putting out my two books that came out as of late. So getting that experience kind of in the field. And I knew journalism wasn't something per se exactly I'd want to do after college, but I knew that it was something that I had enjoyment in the moment. So it was nice to be able to get that experience then. I kind of learned some new skills that I still apply to my day to day, even though I did not choose that career path, but also kind of be able to express myself and put words onto a page, which was a fun, fun thing. So if you did dorm on campus, what is the best dorm building on campus, in your opinion? I <laughs> lived in 182 Broadway and then I lived in 33 Beekman back when, you know, in the retro days, apparently nowadays. Um, I'm always a Beeks boy. Beeks has my heart. Um, Beekman is mentioned in the first page of my first book, literally like hearts up for Beekman. Um, I mean, I definitely think the new one looks because Jackie was posting all those videos on the Instagram and I was just clicking through like, oh my God. Oh, wow. <laughs> but um, I'm a Beekman boy at heart. I am always, I um, 
live with my best friend there and we just had such a great time you know being wholesome being toxic being everything in between <laughs> and I can just picture my Spongebob decor now that I still actually have in my kitchen so I just can visualize it all now amazing so do you have a favorite course that you took at Pace I do I do I actually have a very specific answer for this one um my favorite course I ever took was taught by Sid Ray who is one of the professors in the English department. Um, she is everything to me, Virgo icon. She taught, um, it was a course entirely on Jane Austen. And I had never actually read Jane Austen up until that point. I loved reading, I loved literature, I loved English. And if you had asked me then, I'd say my favorite book was Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. And it was mm -hmm. totally a Gothic, totally a Brontanian. And then I took this course just because it fulfilled requirement and because I, I had Sid in the Shakespeare course the semester prior, and I walked into this course with no expectations, whatever. When I tell you, I now have 11 copies of Emma by Jane Austen, and that just really changed my whole literary, like, trajectory. Um, it was just so fun to be able to, like, sit down with people who, like, actually wanted to talk about literature, and someone who was so passionate in the literature she was teaching, and just have these conversations around, you know, Pride and Prejudice. We, I think we did Persuasion also. We did Emma, like all these different books and just talk about like the impact, the style, watch different like adaptations of it. And I think that was actually a course that I took in like the transition of the shutdown. So I think I started taking it IRL and then, you know, we transitioned to uh, Zoom and everything. And that, I, I remember that was one of the courses that even still, I always did the work. I never faked it. I always did the reading and I always wanted to. Like there was such just like a drive and an inspiration in that course that like I did not see replicated in almost any of my other courses that I took in my time. You mentioned a little bit earlier that you're um, getting your master's in literacy um, education here at Pace. <laughs> Um, can you tell us a little bit about like your experience right now being in the master's program? Of course, I had little to no expectations going into my graduate studies um, because it was one of those things where I started it and then I stopped and then I knew that I had to because when you're a teacher in the DOE, you have to get it within um, five years and I'm on year three. So I was like, okay, we got to start this. But it's been actually really cool um for lack of a better word it's been really interesting i was actually doing a lot of my coursework yesterday um it's been nice because i realized the shift between like my undergraduate studies and my graduate studies is and maybe it's because you know my brain is almost fully developed now at 24 but the materials that i'm being given and like the guiding questions to guide my own education have made me feel really empowered in my kind of academics and in my intellect it almost feels as though I'm being directed to discover these th to discover new things um at my own time and with my own kind of drive which is teaching me one to be more self-delegated in what I do especially since I'm working you know full-time in teaching but also to find kind of ownership over my intelligence and ownership over kind of the academics I'm taking so I'm my course load is actually fully online. So I don't have any courses that are actually on Pace campuses. I believe Pace offers in-person graduate courses. Um, I remember taking courses with graduate students back in the day. But it's actually been, it's made going back to school feel a lot less daunting because I feel engaged in what I'm learning about. And I also feel just like, I don't know, like, excuse me while I get my master's degree. Like, don't, don't talk to me. But yeah, it's been it's it's been nice also like to go, go back to a place that I know. So I don't feel like I'm starting over. Like I know the School of Education staff since there's like maybe five of them. Um, I know kind of the professors. I know the people at Pace. So it's been nice to kind of, you know, return and have some sort of normalcy in this, you know, new chapter of my professional career. So you wrote At a Later Hour, which was published this past December. Congratulations again. What was the process like writing about something so personal to you? And what was your favorite part of that experience? And did you have a least favorite part in that? Oh, God, yes. Um, but the style of writing that I do actually does harken back to my time at Pace. As I mentioned, I did write for the Pace Press. And it was kind of by accident. 
because um, there was a whole turn of events and a whole load of drama that I will save for the grave. But uh, there ended up being a position in a open at the Pace Press. And I knew a lot of people there. And I kind of like jokingly was like, oh my God, I should totally write for you. The next day I had an interview. I was very confused. But nonetheless, I went and I took it. And I started writing. I knew that my writing style was not journalistic. I knew that I really did not care for writing news. I loved receiving news, but I just writing news was never my thing. But I found that what I'd always been writing about was just like dating, whether it be my experience or my friends' experiences. That I felt that that was the most <clears throat> connecting thing for people at you know our age at the time. You know what were what was dating like in 2019? What was dating like in 2018? What was it like in comparison to before? How did dating apps change? The playing field, all those different questions I asked myself about kind of like the politics of romance in our contemporary. So, and it did not help that I was on my second rewatch of Sex and the City. So I sat, I sat down one day and I wrote my first one, which was, um, is he just not that into you or is he a Capricorn? So I wrote (laughs) that one about the kind of onslaught of Capricorn men and their horrific actions against humanity and it like was well received. I was kind of confused. I thought it would be kind of like the smut page hidden amidst the fold. And I didn't think anyone, let alone our advisor would like it. I thought she would find out and like get me kicked off the team the next day. But alas, they actually enjoyed it. And I had people who were like, you know, very kind of like into like, you know, the fact that there was like a little bit of comedy sprinkled into the newspaper especially because, you know, amongst news in 2019, 2020, there was hardly anything positive to report about. So, you know, my little, you know, romance column was a nice little burst in there. So that was where it all started. And um, I put everything together in 2022. And I put out Romantically Ill, which was actually my first book. And that one was like the collection of what I wrote in my time during Pace with some newer ones, but it was mostly the ones I wrote during Pace. And then, you know, put that together. I re-released it the following year because um I got a little bit tired of the cover and so we kind of fixed that one up and put that one out and then at a later hour came out like you mentioned last December and that one's a little bit different for me it follows the same style as Romantically Ill but there's more kind of like poetry in there um just different little things there my favorite part as you asked was kind of like just being able to write about things that I don't often feel comfortable kind of expressing in myself it's almost like my like second layer of self-induced therapy I always knew that I was more comfortable writing about things and speaking about them so um, being able to kind of close certain chapters of my life that I knew I wouldn't be able to close unless I put them um, kind of like paper to page and not only does it do that for me but it also does that with people in my life because I know there are certain people in my life who kind of watched me go through these chapters but weren't able to understand the full scope of what I was feeling, what I was experiencing, what was happening behind very closed and locked doors. And being able to put that out there in a way kind of just like really opens up the truth that I don't feel as though I can always say. But that also lends into my least favorite part. My least favorite part is kind of like those moments before, like I remember, um, I remember where I was when like this one was, you know, coming out and I knew that it was going to come out, you know, like at midnight. And this was my first one that I also put like on an ebook platform. So I knew that it'd be like available to certain people automatically. And that is terrifying. Um, It's awesome to get the truth out, but it's also mortifying to get the truth out at the same time, especially because you can't control other people's reactions. You can't control other people's emotions. And all those reactions and emotions are valid, even if they are opposing to me. So that's always been like my struggle, like writing about real things, writing nonfiction. I feel as though it's a lot harder than writing fiction because people get involved, even if you don't name names, even if you don't, you know, point fingers, but you hint at pointing fingers or you gesture to a direction, people are, you know, valid to their reactions and emotions. So that's been something that I've always dealt with in regards to writing um, the stuff that I do. But at the end of the day, it's like all worth it. I get to, you know, look at this girl every day on my bookshelf. I just think she's stunning. And I get to, you know, be proud in the fact that I was able to write something so personal, but like I was confident in it enough to, like, you know, share it with people.
Amazing. Um, it's just so beautifully written and also the illustrations are amazing as well. Um, so do you have any advice for students or aspiring writers who want to break into the field? I feel like my advice is so redundant. Like, so I feel like it's the advice that I heard, but it's literally just to write, write and write. Um, I found that I only got into kind of writing slumps when I stopped. And then when I tried to pick it back up, um, keep the ball in motion. I feel like even if you are literally writing just a sentence a day, or if you're writing a paragraph a day, two sentences, page, whatever it may be, keep writing and keep reading. I feel as though you only... get better in your craft um, when you read more and you write more because you get to see what the world of literature looks like. And you also get to kind of really figure out your voice and figure out kind of your style and what you want to write. Um, I, yeah, never stop. I just think keep going and never like, I feel as though there were times in my kind of writing career when the imposter syndrome really kicked in and I felt as though because I wasn't writing like in the style of Bronte, Austin, or I don't know, even who's a contemporary person that we value King, I guess, um, because I wasn't writing in that style, my writing wasn't worthy or wasn't valued or wasn't up to par. But then I realized, first of all, you're comparing yourself to two dead people who wrote in the what, what century, Lord knows, not this one. And It, I had to really realize like, no, everyone's voice is different and everyone's style is different. And just because I'm not writing the next great English, you know, masterpiece doesn't mean I'm not writing something that someone won't gravitate towards or someone might learn something from. So I think getting over that hurdle in many kind of writers, especially at the ages, you know, of college students, you know, I think getting past that kind of mental block will really just unlock the confidence to just, you know, write what you write and put out what you have. That's honestly such good advice and like a really good message, especially to like, like younger writers and um, just people like aspiring to kind of like reach where you're at um, in your career. Um, but following that, can we expect to see any more works like um, at a later hour? As per my advice, I never stop writing. I never stop. Hence why I had to re-release my first book because I didn't stop writing and I, even though I published it I was kind of like hee hee he, chapter 33 um so I, so I have not stopped writing when I actually put out at a later hour I posted like on Instagram announced or like saying it out and like one of my last sentences was okay like no more nonfiction. I'm gonna you know put nonfiction away and shift to fiction which I have been doing I've been working on my first novel since 2020 actually and I've been like rewriting it and kind of reworking it which I'm still planning on making that my next like project that I'm focusing on. But did I start writing nonfiction already? Yes. Um, I always pictured kind of like, I call them my alcohol series because the first book has a Cosmo. This one has wine. I always pictured it as a three. I just like the number three. I was born on the third. So for me, it's like, I don't stop at even numbers. I hate even numbers. So will there be another nonfiction project definitely um when lord knows i think i need to experience more life in between um this and that to put something out but i did actually the other day start the first chapter of a nonfiction project um which i have like kind of kept under many 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 wraps until i guess right now um But but yeah, I'm currently working on another fiction pro another nonfiction project and a fiction project that I'm hoping can see the light of day possibly in the next two calendar years. That's honestly like so cool and like exciting, especially seeing the way that you can balance this with being a teacher is just, you know, like, I mean, so, so inspiring, but also like you can tell how much um, hard work you put into it and the effort. Thank you. I try. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you for meeting with us today. You're, you've just been amazing. Thank you so much. It was it was so nice to finally talk to you and um, mm -hmm. just hear your thoughts on everything. Well, thank you, y'all. Thank you. Thank you.